According to the research, if you start running on a consistent basis from today, there is a 79% chance you'll end up with an injury in just one year from now. This is a pretty insane statistic when you consider that children learn to run before they can string a sentence together. Running is basically coded in our DNA. Well, no one understands this paradox better than Dr. Peter Francis, our guest on today's show. Dr. Francis has his PhD in sports and exercise science. He currently lectures at the Carla Institute of Technology. He is the author of multiple publications, including his most recent book, Running From Injury, which is a culmination of his years of academic research and experience as a high level amateur runner. So in this interview, we will unpack many of the topics covered in his book, such as how to start running safely, the importance of mobility and strength training for runners, tips to help one develop their own running program, the benefits of passive versus active recovery methods for runners, and how to properly bounce back after incurring a running related injury. This and so much more in episode three of the Exercising Health podcast. All the topics discussed in today's show are organized in chapters down below for your convenience. Also, a summary of this interview will be posted as a blog on our website. As soon as it is available, you will find it linked down below in the description. With that said, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Chris. Good to talk to you. Good. So I'm going to dive right in uh, because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and, you know, for me, runners, you know, running is a sport that has a pretty low barrier to entry. It seems that all that's required is an adamant mindset, uh, a pair of shoes and the open road. Um, is it really that simple or should we prepare, should we be preparing ourselves a little more for this activity? Um, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, it, it really is that simple. Um, but we're probably not as naturally conditioned and prepared for it as we might have been when we were hunter gatherers. Now, we still have that hunter gatherer body, but we don't use it in quite the same way. So what we need to do is start our running slowly and gradually. And maybe today, if you go outside your house and run to the end of the block and back for 10 minutes, uh, maybe that's where you are. And maybe you, you build from there. And then as your body gets used to it and you get a bit fitter, you'll also begin to enjoy it more because you won't feel like you're about to to bring your lungs up every time you go out. So I think there's a lot of merit in starting slow to build your confidence, your enjoyment, but also to give your body a, a chance. Okay, great. So two things you touched on there, and one is training volume, and the other one is lifestyle. So I want to unpack the first one, which is lifestyle. You mentioned in your book that just like in disease states like diabetes, where it takes years of poor lifestyle before severe health symptoms are experienced, well, running related injuries are no different. It can take it takes a long time to develop as a result of bad running practices. Um, can you provide us with some examples of the most common poor running practices? Yeah, um, running is a sport that's very low on movement variability. The last thing you want to do is add to that. So if you run at the same speed on the same surface, for similar distances, that's very, very repetitive. And that would be a common mistake I would see runners make in terms of developing an overuse injury. And, and it's actually incredibly simple to avoid that. Uh, if you break your 30 minute run into 15 times, one minute where you run a bit quicker, one minute where you jog or even walk in between, because the mechanics that you use to run at different speeds are quite different and it, and it allows that um, within sport variability to take place another thing you can you can do is is to go on an undulating route so that when you go up a hill you've got to lift your leg in a completely different way so that can add some variability you can go on trail or grass you can introduce some barefoot running and that's before we even get to doing some yoga doing some circuit training doing some uh cross trainer doing some swimming whatever uh, which I call outside of running variability. So I think I think there's there's you know a big challenge is is the lack of variability and how runners add to that 
often just through convenience and laziness at times, just, uh, you know, going out the door, getting in a habit. Um, and then, and the other thing that we've kind of touched on is changing things too quickly. Um, you know, your body will actually do an awful lot and, and then adapt to an awful lot of stress, even if it, even if it does lack variability, um, provided that it's done slow enough. Um, so I think runners make a mistake of, of, of changing things too quickly. Um, th those will be kind of two of the most common things that lead to injuries. Now, the reasons are more complex and multifaceted in terms of, are they changing their loading too quickly because they're trying to be somebody they used to be, or they're trying to keep up with their friend? Um, are they uh, not introducing variability because they are so busy and so time poor with work and commitments and so on that they actually don't have the headspace to be able to think of a new route or a new session or a new. Um, so the, the behavioral psychology is what links all of these physical uh, concepts together. Um, another thing that, that influences a runner is their previous injury history and what they've been told about it. So that then feeds into how they train, how they move and, and how they behave. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's an example, I suppose, of, of some of the most common uh, things. Um, and knowing, knowing what causes the injury, I found is the easy bit. Um, but knowing uh, how to understand the behavior and modify it, it takes a little bit more time. And what's your perspective on sort of living like a runner? So what I mean by that is, you know, if we spend eight hours a day at the desk seated and an additional few hours socializing seated as well, and we live this pretty sedentary life, and then we stand up from the chair, put on a pair of running shoes and we start pounding, you know, and we try and, we try and get out of 10K. Do you feel like this, the contrast is too great here where we should rather, you know, be living more like a runner during the day and so that we are a little bit more prepared for the actual action of running, uh, you know, later on. Um, sort of what's your perspective on um, changing your entire lifestyle to be more supportive of running? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think athletes are often shocked when, you know, you, you, you could talk to a high level competitive amateur athlete, you know, maybe, maybe even boarding on international standard. And you could say to them, you know, do you realize you're quite a sedentary person? And they would say, what? You know, they'd say, no, I, I, I just ran a marathon last week, um, you know, a, a sub three hour marathon. And I'm going, and, and you think, well, yeah, but, but your, your life, the majority of your life is quite sedentary. And so people in their head associate sedentary people with people who are not exercising or overweight and whatever, but actually we're a sedentary society and that, that probably doesn't prepare us for activity as well as we could. So there's little ways of trying to adjust that. And that is, you know, maybe I used to park my car 20 minutes from work and walk down because the biomechanics of walking are different. Um, so it's that variability again, um, but it's also a little bit of conditioning. Um, and you've got to walk back up there in the afternoon. I alternate at a standing desk to try and put in some of that. But to be honest, even those little things are probably they're definitely useful um but i think one of the reasons perhaps that things like yoga and even the whole field of strength and conditioning has emerged is to try and um, compensate for this sedentary um lifestyle and so i think that's why it has a role another thing that people are less aware of is i think everybody is aware of the sedentary idea uh it's spoken about so much with, with with obesity and diabetes and so on but i don't think they're aware of the low movement variability idea so we move less but even when we're not being sedentary we're walking in a straight line or we're we're getting in and out of a car it's it's very you know up and down from a chair up and down stairs it's very linear movement there's not much change so um, I was speaking to somebody recently and I was like, you know, when was the last time you had to, to climb over a fence or 
or, or, or get over a gate or, or hop a wall or, you know, so these require different twists and turns and, and, and movements. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a, a challenge. Um, particularly, we have runners in Ireland who were quite famous in the 70s and 80s for, for running huge volumes of mileage um, and, and performing really well. And, and not suffering that many injuries. And, and part of that, I suspect, is that um, their, their, their day-to-day life growing up was a lot more active than the current um, generation, yeah. So it was a lifelong of, of conditioning themselves to that type yeah. of volume. Okay, yeah. well, if let's continue with the topic of exercise variability then. Um, you spoke about in your book, I mean, we could go as close to just within running, uh, the variability between a sprinter and a long distance runner in terms of the biomechanics and the physiological stimuli. Um, how important is it for the distance runner to include some shorter distances and increased pacing into their regime? Uh, very important. And, and regardless of your perspective on training modalities or, um, you know, how to improve performance and, and so on, using your joints and your muscles and your body through a full range of motion is a really smart thing to do if you want to uh, lower your your injury risk it's a form of conditioning and it's a form of variability and at the end of the day if you can um you know lower your injury risk you by default increase your consistency um and therefore your your performance in, in the long run um, so yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really important conditioning strategy. It's a really important variability strategy, and it's also an important confidence strategy because if you've been a slow runner uh, most of your life, your your beliefs about your ability to maximally exert yourself will be maybe on the lower side. Whereas short uh, sprints uh, added to your week. It, it, it actually does grow a confidence in the kind of uh, robust sense of your body and its ability to, to do things. I remember in our first conversation, you you um, emphasized also hill, hill sprinting specifically because the inclination helps to increase even more range of motion in the, in the joints and, um, and get that whole posterior chain at fired up. Um, how often do you include hill sprints into your, into your training? I mean, the, th- the thing the thing for listeners to to appreciate here is that anything that that doesn't give you a choice is quite good. So, like with with the hill, it's, you don't need a coach to say, you know, this is how you get up the hill. You just you get up the hill, but you use mechanics by default that sort of bring that hip, knee, and ankle into a flexed position run as fast as you can to catch that bus over there. You don't, you don't need to get coached into that. You just cannot get there quickly without those mechanics. So, um, you know, barefoot running on the grass, you, you just intuitively, uh, use a different style of running form. So I think it's important for people not to stress the details too much about, um, you know, what exact session they're doing. But just look for natural ways to uh, trick the body into into behaving better. Um, so I I would have done um, probably one session a week where I warmed up and I hopped double leg hops and single leg hops, and then a few maximal sprints up a hill. But at other times in the week I would have did some slow miles barefoot on the grass, and then at other times maybe. Um, if I was warming up to do a track workout, I would have done some some maximal sprinting as part of the warm up on, on a flat track surface. So sometimes it's about being clever. Uh, you might not have to actually change your whole regime that much, but you might need to change your warm up or your cool down. And that could be the way to integrate the, the new material because new material, even if it's small amounts, uh, over six, eight weeks, it starts to add up and make a big change, you know. Sure. I mean, one hill sprint every session for six weeks, it, uh, it accumulates to a yeah. pretty significant number of hill sprints. Yeah. Um, 
And you mentioned, you alluded to the mobility and uh, the benefits of that. And long distance running, it kind of fails to challenge our joints through a wide range of motion. Uh, do you agree that adding in some structured form of mobility work can assist runners in improving the health of their joints? Yes, particularly with the modern lifestyle that we lead. Again, been seated in cramped positions and then trying to go from there to a flat out 10K after work is a recipe for disaster. So I think yoga, mobility, all of that is necessary for modern life as well as for good running form. Yeah. Speaking about strength and conditioning, um, what, what is, why is strength and conditioning such a necessary um, supplement to one's running regime? And then what type of strength and conditioning is useful for runners specifically? So a big, a big thing that I would find coaches or runners are apprehensive about is as soon as we use the word strength and conditioning, it, it, be, it sort of introduces a, an unknown complexity. Um, and, and particularly nowadays, people are aware that uh, people do sports science degrees and they do strength and conditioning master's degrees. And so people are then apprehensive in terms of, God, I wouldn't know where to start. Or I think they have images of Olympic weightlifting and all sorts of stuff. But the stuff that we've already talked about, like running up the hill, running quickly, running barefoot, that's all strength and conditioning training. Now, in, in relation to particular uh, specific strength training, it depends what you're doing and when you're doing it. But one thing I would do early season um, would be a weekly circuit training session. The reason I would do that is the circuit training session allows you to work very hard, but at a very low risk of any injury. So when you're not that fit and you're not that conditioned, and you're trying to slowly build up your miles. It allows you to work really, really hard, all of your muscles to fatigue, a bit like you would on a, on a track session, but without the risk of injury. And, and at the same time, the muscles are becoming conditioned then and more able to tolerate the running that you're gonna do. So that's, so that's one example of how you could use strength and conditioning. Another example would be um, you're very conditioned, you're, training really well um, and you want to get stronger so what you could do then is you could do some weighted exercises in the gym where you're lifting close to say 90 percent of what you can and you're doing maybe three sets of six and the reason you would do that is if you increase your maximal strength then the percentage of, of strength you use to run is going to be lower. So it, it's kind of like a, 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 an improvement in running economy. So the beauty of doing it that way is it's not going to fatigue you too much. So because you keep your strength sessions short um, and heavy, your strength is going up, but your overall fatigue during the week is not going up too much. So that's a useful strategy. But again, the same thing, it introduces, you know, through a range, using your muscles fully, adding variability, you know, you'll get all sorts of different coaches that will debate the exact way you're doing, what you're doing and, and what's best. But what we got to do as distance runners here is zoom out and say, you know, overall, what am I trying to achieve? I'm trying to be a bit more conditioned. I'm trying to be a bit stronger. I'm trying to put some variability in. Um, you know, if I'm early season, maybe I can hit the gym and do some circuits. If I'm later season, maybe I'll just keep some maintenance in with the, with the heavier lifting. So, you know, I, I would say to people, um, with all of this stuff, don't sweat the details, Just just do it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there certainly must be a point of diminishing returns when it comes to strength training. Perhaps if you focus too hard on it, um, you can get a bit heavy, um, you know, so that the benefits of sort of protecting you uh, from injury and, and um, you start to, to lose that, you know, because you start to become really heavy and that becomes ultimately harder on the joints over many miles. Uh, so 
sort of using the way I understand it is using strength and condition as a sort of supplement rather than a primary focus. Uh, would would you agree with that? Yeah, although it's funny because um, again, if I mention that er- kind of early season thing, and when I first made a comeback and 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 ran decent for ten k, the circuit training on a Thursday was a really key session. Um, it was it it was as I said, it allowed me to work really hard, and I think that actually directly increased my fitness if you like so so it can be used as a an integral training session that that can make your running improve i mean what what it also does is in that scenario is it allows you that feeling of working hard without making a silly decision with your running so the temptation might be there to to do a massive track session when you're not conditioned or to do a long run that's too long or to you know do intervals that you're not quite ready for whereas this circuit training session gives you that feeling and gives you some of the adaptations and benefits at the muscular level but um allows you get conditioned now you know i ran 34 20 for 10k with with that thursday circuit training session as probably the highest intensity thing i did it can actually depending on where you're at, it can actually facilitate improvement. Now, in later programs, when I was very conditioned, all programs are a series of trade-offs, so you can't have everything you want. So I had eight Ks of track work. I had a threshold run. I had a long run. You know, I needed to get my yoga done, maybe some recovery on the bike. So I had to kind of say to myself, how do I keep the benefits of strength and conditioning, but in a way that's sustainable with the overall program? So what I did was I hit the gym twice a week with maybe four exercises, um, you know, low, low, low volume. And, and that, that kept me strong while I progressed the endurance size. So I think the message there is that, you know, you can actually get to the same place using two different um, programs. And one program can be more relevant to where you're at at one point and less relevant to where you're at at another point. And another thing I would say is part of the change in my programs as I got consistently better and better was, yes, a need to try and improve further and a need to try and get more efficient with what I was doing. But also you get bored, so you need, you know, to change it. So. For example, I could have, I could have potentially started out with the weight training and the running and ran 34, 20, and then been like, got fatigued with that process and then used the circuit training in the later block for, to bring me to a new level and to, to add that variety. You see what I mean? So it's multifaceted in terms of how central a role or otherwise it plays um, and and what it, it 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 gives you, but there's lots of ways to get this the same runner to the same outcome, you know. Yeah, and I guess uh, you know breaking up the training week by including a a circuit only session on a Thursday, and you know not running, kind of you, it breaks that monotony of running every day, and then maybe Friday comes and you super excited and you're full of vigor for that run and perhaps you put in uh, in a greater effort into that into that friday's run just because the day before you took a bit of a mental break from running um, and did something something else that was um different so and just for list for listeners on that to realize um my running talent is is very average and and i ran 34 20 from three days a week running so you know um, and when I ran 33, 46, that was from four days a week running. So wow. I, I don't have running pedigree as such. You know, I mean, I, you know, you know, when you're a kid, you know, even late, late teens, you know, I, I might qualify for the national championships, but, but not much more than that. My times were, were pretty average, but it's amazing when you work hard at something consistently what happens and that's what's always excited me about human performance and sports science and it's the capacity for change it's the capacity for uh 
achieving things that were just beyond your imagination in terms of of what you felt your your ability was and so you know to remind runners who you know i know some people read the book and say oh he's running at a much higher level than me but what i'd say is yeah but just remember that was three days a week initially and then four days a week and after that so if you're if you're if you're a talented runner let's say you're you know you're a real 31 32 minute type runner but you're getting injured all the time you know imagine if you just if you just changed your approach uh did some of this other training um ran a bit less but got really consistent where would you go if if i can go from 36s to 33s where where are you going to go if you can get some consistency you know that's 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 what's cool about this this stuff you know well, talking about consistency, um, you mentioned a few times in your book that you prefer the concept of consistent, moderate effort in your training rather than periodization. Yeah. Um, for the listeners who don't know, periodization is a method of cycling your training between hard and easier weeks or blocks. You then illustrated the power of being consistent in a graph of your training over a three-year period. Um, I love this graph. Uh, the graph compares Dr. Francis's weekly running mileage to his 10 kilometer running time over a period of 150 weeks. So despite only a slight increase in weekly training volume over this three year period, your 10 kilometer running time showed a steep, almost linear improvement. Um, can you perhaps explain in greater detail what is going on here? Is a complex training program of macro and meso cycles and tapers and all the rest not that optimal? Um, you know, what's the benefits of just keeping it basic and, and just being consistent over a long period of time? Firstly, I realize that it's kind of controversial to um, be somewhat dismissive of periodization because um, there's so many. Uh, strength coaches and and you know r really highly qualified experienced people who who see it as really important and and i and i do think it has a role um but but again what i like to do is get out from underneath all the terms and the names so it's a bit like strength and conditioning it's getting out from that behind that and saying what what is that you know um so with training the human body i find it 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 doesn't know what day or you know what week it is it doesn't know whether you're on an up week or a down week it's just an organism responding to stimulus so if let's say for to simplify it for people that a, that a simple periodization model might be three weeks working hard and then one week uh, recovering and the idea for everybody out there listening is that if i work hard for three weeks and i'm tired then i have an easy week and my fitness comes up a level and that's the kind of basic idea of periodization whereas if i just train hard all the time then i i'm just going to get fatigued and burnt out but what I would say is, what if on week two or week three, your body is tired then? What, what do you do then? Do you, do you just plow on and say, no, no, until week four, I don't, you know, take it off. Okay, so then in week four, when you're absolutely cooked, you take your easy week. And really your easy week is spent trying to get out of the hole that you've put yourself into. So this is where trying to align biology with a calendar becomes difficult. So, you know, let's say Chris, that you were training and your training's going really well, but the birth of your daughter comes along and your whole training week goes upside down, you know, and let's say it just goes upside down for a week. It's like, are you better to accept that, roll with that as it's happening, and then resume the following week when things go back to, to normal? And what allows you to do that is if you've got a really nice block of consistency coming into that week, when that week goes upside down, 
it's very easy to pick it back up again on the other side without any massive changes in, in loading. So the trouble with periodization is that the plan is fantastic on paper, but if life uh, gets in the way, it then needs to be adjusted. Um, whereas if you're training at a certain level all the time, and you know, let's say 20 out of 22 weeks, you don't have a problem in your life. What it means is that you're, you're consistently at a very high level. And it means that if something goes wrong, you can, or you get sick, you know, you pick up a flu or a, a virus or whatever, or your work becomes really stressful for that week, you can just back off. And then you can just pick it back up again the following week because you're so consistent that it's that it's easy. Whereas if you're cycling things up and down, and let's say week three goes wrong, and so does week four, you now have a massive jump in loading to try and get back up to 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 the next block or the next um, phase. Now, if you're at a very elite level, I think you can do things that, that could be useful, like over the course of a long season, you could alternate weeks from more aerobically focused to more higher intensity stuff and then switch back to aerobic and then switch back. You know, I, I do think when you're playing with stuff like that, um, it, ha it has a role and particularly maybe in team sports where there's going to be games and things where you where maybe you can manipulate training at certain times of the year but even within all that you still got to have a consistent um moderate load so I, i'm not doing a brilliant uh job at explaining that to be honest but um i i i just got to the point where i realized that consistency was king and that it was easier for me to accept setbacks if I if I went that way and I was also less likely to try and catch up whereas if you've got a three or four week block that says this and you miss it the, the animal in you wants to catch back up whereas if you're just saying oh I've got a hundred weeks behind me and this one week is going a bit wrong it doesn't mess with your head you know in, in mm -hmm. the same way you know and it's that catch up that increases our risk of, uh, for injury um, you know, because we, we we tend to just overdo it, and and this is a great segue into the habit and headspace uh, topic. Um, there's those are two things you mentioned re that's really important: um, having the right headspace for training, and making exercise a daily habit. Um, can you elaborate on these two essential training practices? So headspace. If 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 you want to do anything well. You need time and, and headspace. So if if you were asked to uh, write an essay on the benefits of strength and conditioning, if if you're really busy, you can you can clip together a few bits from Google and you can you know write out two pages and you can submit it. Um, but the chances are it won't be that good and you won't be that satisfied with it. But because you haven't had much time and you've, you've got other things going on, you know, that will do and you, you'll just get it in. And whereas if, if, if you're asked to write an essay on strength and conditioning and you have the time and the headspace to really write a considered piece, it's going to go much better. Um, and the quality of what you're going to put in is going to be a lot better and your satisfaction is going to be a lot higher. And with running, it's no different. So, when you have time, you can arrive to your training session, you can limber up, you can run, you have time to cool down, you can take it in, you can, you can feel good about it, you can go home and have a good meal, have a good sleep. And the quality of what's going on in that process is so much higher. Whereas if you're trying to run and you're really busy in work and everything else, chances are you're rushing to the car, you're, you're turning up at the run, you're smashing out the run, then you're getting back to do this other task. So the quality of the running you're doing is not that good, but equally the quality of how you recover is not that good. So I learned that you, I had to make space for it, right? So as a little bit of a high achiever who's an interest in a lot of things and 
studying this and working on this project and doing that, I had to get a bit more disciplined to, to say, hang on, you know, do you want to have a go at this running stuff properly? Uh, if the answer is yes, fine. It's not going to involve crazy miles or crazy training, but it's going to involve you consistently being able to deliver a high, you know, quality, you know, and even some days all I might have to do is yoga that day, but I still needed the time and the space to do that yoga, to, to do it properly, uh, you know, uh, to get home and, and do all the other stuff. Um, so that's headspace. And, and what was the second thing, Chris? It was about habits. And oh, maybe yeah. I can just interject for a second, um, because I think you mentioned something that's really important. Um, you know, when you have this busy lifestyle, how sometimes you can feel overwhelmed with mm. with training. Well, when you set yourself for this Goliath task, this massive training block or whatever, mm -hmm. and you've, you know, your week could be upside down or you have so many other projects that you're simultaneously trying to balance at the same time. Well, you know, when you've got this big cloud hanging over you in the form of, of a difficult training session, um, you're less likely to do it. Something was a bit of an aha moment for me in your book. You mentioned about brushing your teeth and how it it's becomes a daily habit for us. And the way I perceive it is because it's just a simple task, you know. Um, but if brushing our teeth was super complex and and required a lot of resources and time, I think despite the benefits, we'd be less likely to to do it and to formulate that habit. So would you say that part of being, you know, they kind of work, work with each other, habits and headspace, because if you, if you create a program that is uh, super uh, easy and attainable to, to achieve and uh, that you can be consistent in and you can eventually form a habit, you'll by default be in a better headspace because you don't feel so overwhelmed all the time. Yeah, so, so that's to do with the cognitive um, load. So if you, the, the, the thing about habits is they reduce it to an automatic uh, behavior, which means you're not thinking about it, which means you have more headspace. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, and that's a good way maybe for people to visualize this is, you know, visualize your brain like a container, you know, and everything you've got to think about is kind of filling up that container, you know, so um, when it when it overflows, it's it's that's when the problems start. But habits like brushing your teeth, they don't really fill the container because they it's like they're embedded somewhere else that, they, they, you know, they don't they don't occupy headspace. So um, one way I would have used it would be. The, the, the faster I got, the more. I was trying to push the margins of training consistently within a seven day working week. So I wanted to up certain aspects of training. Like, could I get um, a bike session in, um, for example, but I didn't want to up um, the sort of amount of space that all of that stuff was occupying because I knew that was finite. So I started saying to myself, right, if if I've got a whole day twice a week where the main focus is yoga and I've got a whole day where it's circuit training and I've got. How could I get the benefits of those components of fitness, um, but create more space for like an extra bike ride? So at this point, I've got a good reservoir of yoga and all of that stuff behind me strength and conditioning. So I can set up some habits that allow me maintain those gains and make space for a new session. So one way I did it was in the morning, um, I would always have to do some Achilles exercises. And so I get up and put on my coffee and my weighted vests and I would start to do my Achilles exercises. But I started to do a 20 minute app guided yoga session in the morning. So it was 20 minutes in that it wasn't a big time cost. It was before I even left the house for my day. So what that meant was now I didn't need the yoga class in the middle of the day. So there was space for something else. So by having a habit 
where I consistently did 20 minutes every day of yoga, I no longer needed those two one hour classes um, in the middle of the day. So now I can do, you know, that two hour bike ride that might just give me that extra bit of aerobic capacity to, to run the way I needed to run. Or in some ways that made space for me being able to go to the gym twice a week to lift heavy because there was a bit more room. You know, you're at that point, I was starting to play with the margins of what can I still do in a smart way here? Because number one is it, I've got to be able to go to work, get back, recover, eat and all of that to work. So so it, there is a finite limit. But by using habits where I just got up, you know, had coffee, did 20 minutes yoga and went out the door to work, I wasn't really thinking too much about that and it wasn't putting the load up and 20 minutes is 20 minutes it's 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 you know what i mean so so that's an example of how you're using habit in, in a way that's not occupying too much headspace and that leaves a bit more room maybe to push your program on a bit you know yeah it's a, it's a great way to sort of hack the system because 20 minutes is far less invasive to your routine than uh, finding you know two one hour sessions per week yeah so you're more likely to be consistent and, you know, consistency breeds, uh, breeds gains at the end of the day. Um, and talking about habits, I recently listened, you know, I want to talk about training partners. I recently listened to a podcast with Dr. Daniel Lieberman on his new book, Exercised, um, The Science of Physical Activity, Rest and Health, and he explained the benefit of training partners and how they can hold you accountable to your exercise regime. However, you look at things a little differently in your book when you explain that it is actually an injury risk in training with others. Can you expand on this for our viewers, please? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but the, the, my most successful training and performances uh, came when I went my own way. It's not an either or, but maybe let's look at why that is. The beauty about doing your own thing is you can design the week that works for you. So my week was designed, you know, based around where I lived, where my work was, where the facilities nearest to me were, you know, so, so what it meant was the resistance to flow was very low. So, you know, again, like I did yoga because it was good, but, but, but a big reason I did it was because it was in the, the gym downstairs from my work at, you know, at lunchtime. So what that meant was there was no headspace for me to get from work to yoga. Now, if that class had been Pilates, I still would have done it because I'm not sweating the details about, you know, exactly what I'm doing. Right. But it's about what will give me biggest return with least resistance to flow. So. I know the Pilates will give me similar things to the to the yoga. So, you know, the, the, as I said, the yoga decision was made because it was useful, but also because it fitted in my day. There was no energy loss getting to and from uh, yoga. So that so that's that's a that's a decision you can make when you're able to do your own thing. You know, um, there's 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 other examples. Um, maybe. I could do a track session on a on a morning when my first lecture was not till 11. So I've actually used the morning really well and got one of the biggest workouts of the week done. Um, you know, that means that afternoon when I get back from work, I'm in recovery mode. I'm not trying to go out at half seven at night and train, you know, so um, there's that. And uh, another thing is, you can listen to your body and run at the speed you need to run at. So, you know, even when I would do track sessions with pretty ambitious splits, you know, there would be days where that wasn't happening. Um, and let's say I was trying to run 320Ks. There'd be days where my body would just, it would feel like 320Ks, but I'd be running 335. And when you're on your own, you can just accept that. And you can just do 335s that day. Uh, where there's someone with you, you're more likely to overreach and keep up. And now you're you're back to this external thing, just like periodization. You're back to being controlled by an outside force. And um, 
that's not always good for what you need to do consistently in the in the long run. Now, there's lots of benefits to having people train with you. Um, you know, particularly for a company and to reduce the boredom and and in the right dose, a competitive challenge can be good. Um, but it's got to be in the right dose. Um, you know, is 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 what I found um, with it. I I mean, I did have uh, one friend of mine train with me a little bit in my last program, and he was just getting into running, so that worked because he might run four or five miles of my fifteen mile long run, and he was getting what he needed, and I was getting some company, but it wasn't going to make me, you know, overreach um, or that. So. Yeah, I, I can definitely see what he's saying. If, if I was trying to get someone into an exercise habit, uh, you know, turning up with their friends is going to make it easier. But at this point, you're trying to be a competitive runner and not get injured. It's probably a different type of person who's who's taken on that challenge, you know. Yeah, well, super interesting because you referenced that 2011 study in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine uh, which revealed that even though people who train in groups were uh, more satisfied with their training, they were 2.5 times more likely to be injured. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a, it was very interesting. Um, ch chapter two is all about the, the reference points and how they affect us. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, the worst reference point is yourself. Whatever, whatever you d you've done before, that becomes an imaginary competitor beside you. In the same way that when you're in a training group, uh, you've got a competitor, you know, so it's those are the two the two people to watch out for yourself and others. They're both doing the same thing to you. you know? Yeah, sure. So you have to you have to train humbly. I think if you can train humbly yeah. and you, you're going to avoid a lot of a lot of injury um, and talking about active recovery for our connective tissue. So. Can you exp can you please explain the difference between um, the importance of maintaining some level of training volume to maintain the health of our connective tissues? Um, for instance, you present the example of managing your own Achilles tendon pain uh, by remaining constant consistent with your training. How do you differentiate between the pain that warrants a decrease in load versus one that can benefit that can benefit from your from maintaining our current training load? Yeah. So that that. There's no simple answer to that and that it's a very individualized thing. But in my experience, um, if you've got pain that's less than four out of 10 and it's not going up, myself and others included have been able to train quite well. And we would probably describe it as a niggle. Now, if you're at a two out of 10 and it starts to go three, four, five, in that scenario, the sooner you stop, the sooner you get back running. So that's when you need to be smart. And that comes with getting to know your body. Now, if your pain is going three, four, five, you need to stop running, but you still need to find a way to optimally load the tissues around it and even the tissue itself to some extent. The trouble is if you stop, stop completely, everything begins to decondition. And now when you come back training, you're predisposing yourself to more problems because you've got to then up, up the load. So what I would do when I was um, managing my Achilles and I, because I had that niggle a few years, I got to know it very well and, and how to work with it. And um, so I might remove running for a day or two, but I would do very heavy calf raises or something. Um, and not even through a full range, but just firing up that muscle and tendon um even in a small range it was keeping everything conditioned while giving it a break from the the repetitive action that was that was annoying it um so that would be an example you know okay so i mean that can kind of shift us into the topic of recovery versus rest um they used inter interchangeably however it seems to me that you see a distinction between the two can you please clarify the difference between rest and recovery and why it seems that you lean more towards periods of recovery from training um, as a means to bounce back from injury? In some ways, I think this probably feeds back into our conversations at the start about how um, 
conditioned or not we are nowadays as a species um so maybe maybe a long time ago rest was a smart thing because you know maybe we've trekked across the savannah for four days you know without sleep and you know all of this and complete rest for a day was probably the exact correct thing to do but the trouble now is that uh Complete rest is the is the is the normal state, the default state, which is not serving us so well. So in in a society where we're so sedentary anyway, I, I feel like we need to keep moving at some level all the time. And so recovery is a way of resting the particular uh energy system or or, or muscles and tendons we're using. Um, but remaining active and conditioned at the same time. I mean, I I fully appreciate the need for um, for rest and and recovery and downtime, you know, and and even a complete training, you know, break from training. But a, a way to look at it might be: you're a good runner, you train all the time, and you go on your holidays. On your holiday, you can be outdoors and going for a hike in the mountains and going for a swim in the sea and having a nice barefoot walk on the beach and you can do zero running and you can do zero even structured training sessions if you like but if you do those types of activities you're you're recovering but you're not resting totally and so your legs are not going to get a big shock when you come back and i think this gets even more important um 28, 29, 30, as you start to get older, uh, I, f- I found that the body gets more and more intolerant to rest. Um, it, it, it really doesn't like it. Um, well, it, it loves it in the short term, but but mm-hmm. when you come back, it's saying, no, no, this, this is not happening. So, um, so yeah, recovery means that you're on the move um, but just maybe not running or, or whatever, yeah. Okay, and in sort of low impact means of, of training, so let's say we're in, an, in a bit of an injured state and you know loading those tissues too much um, you know, doesn't feel good, but we want to try and keep our fitness and, and not regress too, too, too far. You've, uh, you, you speak quite fondly of the cross trainer. It's a, an elliptical device that closely resembles proper running biomechanics. Um, yeah. This has been a device you've used to stay fit during your periods of, of, of injury and even beyond. How, how do you use this device and, and sort of do you think, are there any other substitutes that are very similar to the cross trainer that you would use at sort of to increase your vo- volu- train, overall training volume without too much um, impact on the joints and uh, connective tissues? Yeah, so I did use it to actually increase volume. I just liked that I I was upright and I could mimic I could mimic the running action, um, and I could even just get my arms into that, but without the the connective tissue stress. So I think it was useful um, that way, and so I just basically didn't use the handles. Um, now there are some cost trainers where it's really long and. Not those ones, but there's other ones where it's there's a nice kind of short stride to them. So it was, it was those ones that I used. It's worth telling a short story, but I, I remember being out with, for a period where I had five weeks with no running and I was rehabbing my Achilles and so on. And I started to swim in the river and cycle my bike. And I did that intensively. And then I came back running and I was doing... You know, I was building a five mile run to an eight mile run and building two four hundreds on a track to twelve four hundreds, you know, very small stuff coming back. And about four weeks after that, I, I ran a 5K race and I equaled my personal best. Um, wow. So so it just shows, you know, that the cross training stuff, um, I think a lot of runners get a little bit frustrated with it because they think, oh it's not the same and it's not as good and you know and that's and that's obviously true to an extent right but don't underestimate the power of what you can do if you're very fit again if you're consistent and then you start doing some of this supplementary training 
it won't take much running at all for you to um, come back as good as you ever were, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, so would you use other forms like uh, a rowing machine, um, Airdyne, for example, or salt bike? You know, what's, what sort of other devices would you recommend other than the cross train if people don't have access to that? Yes. Yeah, so a great way I used to work out hard when I, when I couldn't run was a um, really simple session on a spin bike. I would do 20 times 30 seconds as hard as I could, and I'd get 30 seconds rest in between each one. And the aim would be to basically have the legs spinning as fast as possible rather than under a big resistance. And the magic of that was your heart rate would go sky high, but it would stay high even on the rest periods, it would stay high. So you're getting 20 minutes of a, of a high intensity effort for only 10 minutes of, of work. So I found it mentally doable. Um, you know, big, big thing to, to let go of as a runner is when you're not running, don't try and don't try and have a cross training program that kind of mirrors or matches your exact running schedule. Adapt and kind of change. And so, you know, I, that was my 20 minutes of of blast. I didn't compare it to what I would have been doing on the track or you know whatever. Um, but again, with all of this stuff, rowing machines, all this, um, do do what you've got nearest to you. So um again the spin bike was downstairs in work so I, I used that on the weekends the rugby club where i was the physio they happened to have a rowing machine so on a saturday i would do something there so you see the way i'm not i'm not obsessed about what it is um i'm, I'm working with what i have with a focus on consistency you know so it's just like as long as i train as long as i stay fit um, I'll be all right. You know, that whether I have this particular bike or that or whatever, you know, if I, you know, if I have my preferred option, great. If I don't, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? As long as, as long as I'm consistent, um, and I'm getting enough work done while I'm out, it won't take me long to come back, you know? Totally. And something, you know, I've been toying around with in my head as well. Um, cause I'm going through a bit of a niggle with my training too, um, and my body, um, is trying to perceive that period, your recovery period as an opportunity to work on some weaknesses, um, things that um, you maybe you, you struggle to, to, to pay attention to when you've got so much else going on in your training. And perhaps if you think that way, you can come back even stronger. Um, so, you know, maybe change the mindset of, this is this is a terrible situation to be in as opposed to this is an opportunity to come back even stronger how do you try i mean you you struggled with injury for over 12 years um sort of what yeah. are the the sort of mental games you used to play with yourself to to try and help you uh, refocus and and get that confidence to just come back even stronger every time yeah. well i think the first thing to say is in the 12 years i didn't play those games very well at all so that was the, that was part of the problem um in the next in the next three years when i was good i knew exactly how to play those games um so firstly i no longer saw myself as a runner or an injured runner i saw myself as an athlete and an athlete is always hunting to get better so when i when i would have an interruption i was inspired i used to think oh I've got all this time now to do, you know, I would have loved to have been able to keep that circuit training going, but I couldn't because I was running and, or, you know, I really, I really need to top up on my yoga and mobility and, oh, I'm gonna, you know, and then like, you know, I would push myself on a bike session, you know, each week, I, you know, I remember doing something like I go on Saturday morning for 60 K and I, I'd say, right, I'm going to see, can I get around without breakfast? And then the following week, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get around, without any drop off in pace at 70 K and then 80 K and then 90 K. And then, you know, so then, like I said, when I did come back, you know, a few four hundreds on the track and I'm equal in my best. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's mind games, but it works, you know, in terms of, um, so yeah. And I saw all of that training very much as part of my consistent streak 
So I was three years with no pause in, in training. Now, you know, I was, I think, I think I'm, I only missed eight weeks, um, where I didn't run in, in, in the three years. So I had mastered how to be able to run all the time. I mean, that's key, you know, um, but in the little pauses, there were no pauses, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Totally. Um, so to conclude our amazing conversation, because obviously, um, your book has, you know, all of this in, in greater detail and so much more. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is specific exercise prescription. Uh, from, I gathered from reading your book is that you tend to avoid giving very specific exercise prescriptions to people unless you work with them very closely. Can you explain to our viewers why giving blanket exercise prescri prescriptions can be a shot in the dark and how um, it can even put uh, people at a greater risk for injury? Yeah, I mean, I think that's so important. Um, just just even for society in general at the moment, um, with, with making decisions on your life and health and nutrition and everything, basically you're not empowered if you're getting blanket statements and it means you don't know what to do when the blanket statement doesn't deliver the, out, the desired outcome. And, um, you know, I, I could write you a program on this call, Chris, and then, you know, you go off, I'm in Ireland, you're in Cyprus and then week two, it's not working. And you're like, Oh, right. I'll forget about that. And you know, that's the end of it. Whereas if you understand the concepts, um, you are then empowered to adapt and adjust within your life to make it work. So for example, I might have written on your program that you should do that 20 times 30 second bike session. And you then realize, oh, the local gym has only got a rowing machine. But you, you, know, you know what you're trying to achieve now so you just do 20 times 30 seconds on the rowing machine. You don't worry about the fact that you haven't got the, so you're not impeded by it, you know, or uh, someone locally does Pilates, but they don't do yoga, you know, and rather than killing yourself, trying to follow a YouTube yoga class, you just go to the Pilates and you just do that, you know, or you've not got any hills, but there's a great set of steps up the road and you just, do, you know, you do the quick feet on the steps or, you know, um, You've not got any grass, but you, you kind of find a beach where you're thinking, OK, this is a bit like grass. This is this is, you know, so you're empowered to use the, the concepts as you need to as you need to use them. Or, you know, you're looking at my program that's going from. 30 miles a week to 40 miles a week over the course of three years, and you're thinking, well, I can only do 10 miles a week, but you, you're able to say, OK, so I'll do 10 for this block a week and then after that eight weeks i'll do 12 and so you're living you're, you're 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 copying my concepts but not my program and mm -hmm. and what's cool then is if you're doing 100 mile a week and you're trying to get to the olympics you're still copying the concepts not the not the program you know so it means that everyone's empowered at their level and that's why you know what I, I look i i do appreciate that sometimes we all need a little bit of a structured program to kind of set us off, you know, and I don't, I don't mind doing that, but what I really want to get to with people is that they, they can tell me the answer that, you know, and that, I think, I think one of the reasons in the book, the first 10 chapters. And I think the reason for that is if I've done a good enough job in the first 10 chapters, you know, the answers that are coming in the next eight chapters. And that's really what I want. I want you to understand mm -hmm. the problem so well, that the solutions are obvious, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like reading the chapter where it's like, you know, uh, crossing the road into oncoming traffic is really dangerous. And then the chapter in the second half of the book, Oh, I bet he's going to tell us not to cross the road into, um, you know, so it's that, that, that's what I'm trying to do, you know? And I think that's the sign of a great coach is one that empowers the athletes to start to think about their training um themselves um because i think a lot of athletes take for granted how how well they actually i mean they live in their bodies they have so many signals um and they understand they they understand themselves um if we if we can just educate them on the principles which are pretty rigid 
um, the details are very flexible from there. And, um, you know, an athlete, um, you know, if they're given and they're empowered with the, with the right education and those principles, um, I think they can, you know, they can serve themselves pretty well um, as opposed to being totally dependent for everything on a coach um, all the time. Um, so, yeah, that's, it's awesome. And, and that's exactly what I felt like when I was reading your book is, um, you know, you really solidify those concepts over and over again throughout the book. And, um, and by the end, you, you're totally certain and, and it, it's, you understand exactly what, what it is that, you, that you're trying to project. So um, where can people find the book and, and more information about your blog and, and your social media, etc.? So the, the blog is just peterfrancis.blog and uh, the book is on Amazon. Okay, great. Well, I'll put all the links down in the description. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe we can start a conversation in the comments as well and the YouTube video um, and people can get in there and, and maybe even uh, uh, we, can, we can start a conversation and continue the conversation down in the comments as well. Uh, Dr. Francis, thank you so much for your time once again. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Super enlightening. Um, and I'm pretty sure we're going to have to have you on again at some point in the future because there's still so much to talk about. Um, so one of the most difficult things preparing for this interview was what questions to ask because there's just so many. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for the privilege and I hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks for watching episode three of the Exercising Health Podcast. See you in the next one. Cheers.